Good morning and welcome everybody. If you can hear my voice out in the foyer, I'll invite you to come on in. And for everyone who's already inside, would you stand with us? And uh, yeah, let's just really engage in this time that we have to come together to worship our risen and reigning Lord. And uh, yeah, let's encourage one another as we sing these songs. Why don't I begin the service by praying this morning? Lord, you have been so good to us. Thank you for blessing us with the opportunity to gather and worship and to build one another up in faith. Lord, we invite you to speak to us this morning. God, would you be at the center of everything we do? We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You can feel free to clap your hands as well. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before him stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? One more time. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him.
we sing this next song, I'm going to take a moment to read from Hebrews 4. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. So let's sing confidently, knowing that God's grace is sufficient for us and that he has invited us into his grace. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, oh, I am free. in me and where you are Lord oh, I am free holiness is Christ in me Lord I need you oh I need you every hour I need you my one Teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you.
It was my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life is yours, and I will sing of your goodness forevermore. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve the praise, worthy is your name. And now my shame is gone, I stand amazed. In your love undeniable Your grace goes on and on And I will sing Of your goodness forevermore Worthy is your name Jesus You deserve the praise Worthy is your name Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Be exalted now in the heavens. As your glory fills this place, you alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Let's sing it again. Worthy is your name. deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. sing worthy, oh worthy is your name, worthy, oh worthy is your name, and what gift of grace 
Is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold. My sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. I know the chains are released. I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me. Until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not i but through christ in me yet not i but through christ in me amen god we give you thanks that you have done the work and that we can say hallelujah Lord, you are the Savior, and we give us, give ourselves into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you to David and the worship team for leading us in worship and really giving us the appropriate context for coming to God's word today. Our sermon series is called The Beginning and the End, looking at the beginning of God's story, the story in the Bible, and looking at the end. And in this story of God, there are, are four emphases, creation, the fall, redemption, and restoration. Now, I'll put it that way because we started in chapter 1 of Genesis, we looked at the creation of the world, and then end of the chapter and into chapter uh, two, we looked at the creation, the beginning of humankind, but that creation theme comes up again and again. And then that theme of the fall, the introduction of sin into the world, that comes up again and again. And last week, Pastor Caleb looked at the beginning of the fall, the beginning of sin, and the beginning of redemption. And that redemption is something that is a common theme throughout the Bible, highlighting in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That was the high stroke of redemption. And now we come to the other end. And we would love to go from Genesis 1-2 because everything is so perfect there. And, and rush on to Revelation 21 and 22, the new heaven and the new earth but we would miss all of our current reality. And we'd miss the reality of the Bible because the fact is, not only did Adam and Eve sin, but each one of us has sinned as well. And not only in the sense of individual acts, behaviors, yes, that, but in the sense that we have a bent towards sin. That's what the fall did to us. That's what happened in the fall. And we all need that redemption that we find in Jesus and in Jesus alone. And on the other end, we'd love to rush into the new heaven and the new earth and, and the restoration. But having, having stopped on Genesis 3 and, and knowing some of that story that continues on, we can't do that. Because Genesis 20 and 21 and 22 are a unit. They go together. And not only do we need Genesis 3 and to be aware of the fall and, and the beginning of sin and the beginning of redemption, we need to be aware of Revelation 20 and the last judgment that enters into the new heaven and the new earth. We can't just skip from Genesis 1 and 2 to Revelation 21 and 20 state, and 22, to that, what, what we call the eternal state, the way things will be forever and ever after that final judgment. Well, Revelation 20 is a chapter about judgment, and I want to focus today on the last few verses, 11 to 15, which is about the last judgment. But before we drill down on those verses, I want to briefly look at the beginning verses in chapter 20 up to verse 11. So if you can take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation chapter 20, I'm going to read through the first few verses as a context to what we'll really be talking about today and just give a few comments. Revelation, book of Revelation, note please there is one revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not revelations. This is one revelation of Jesus Christ with different elements that are part of that revelation. Chapter 20, Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus 
and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, you probably know there are differences of opinion on this passage. And uh, unless you've read through the book of Revelation, there certainly are some things said in these few verses that uh, you don't understand, you'd like to understand, and I'm not going to tell you all about these verses today. What I want to do is just share my position um, that comes from these verses. And my position is the classical or historic premillennialism. And I say that, or people say that, because it's the view of the early church and the dominant view over the centuries since the book of Revelation was written. And I have a graphic to show you. And it's going to go up here. Um, classic premillennialism is also the view taken by the AGC, the Associated Gospel Churches, of which we are a part. So, there we go. Okay, really briefly. This graphic comes from a book called Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem. I wish you all had a copy. I recommend it. It would answer a lot of your questions. So taken from Wayne Grudem, and in the book he talks about the different views of the millennium and gives graphics for each one. So just a really brief explanation here. So we have the church age that starts with Acts 2. That's when the church came into being with the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's the birth of the church. And that will last right until Christ returns. Now in this graphic, you see there's a T after church age right at the end. And the idea is at the end, there will be an intensification of tribulation before Christ returns. There's a lot of tribulation right now. No, not here. Not for us, not in North America, but in many places around the world, the church of Jesus Christ is suffering great tribulation even now. It's hard to imagine that it would magnify. But at the end, there will be a great tribulation that happens, and then Christ will return. When Christ returns, as he's returning, the believers are caught up in the air. Those that are dead will rise first, Paul says. And then those that are here will rise as well. We'll have a resurrection body. And then we will come with Christ to the earth. So it's an immediate thing that happens. And then begins the millennium. Now the word millennium is not found in the Bible. If you look up a concordance and try to find it, you won't find it. It means 1,000 years, and we just read about that. Millennium comes from Latin. And it came into our theology through Latin, which one time was the, the language of the church. And so we've kept that word millennium. It means a thousand years. And so Christ will reign for a thousand years with the believers that have been resurrected. And then at the end of that thousand years, a time of uh, incredible peace, the peaceful kingdom. At the end of that time, Satan will be allowed to exert some more um, of his influence. He will deceive some. Uh, I, like, how can anyone be deceived when Jesus is physically present? I mean, how could you just pretend to worship him or rebel in your heart? I, I don't understand that. But apparently there are some who will be deceived by Satan. Many, in fact. And Satan will come. But again, notice there's really no battle that takes place. Fire comes from heaven. Done. That's it. Then the judgment. Now, this is where everybody agrees. 
There will be a great judgment and then the new heaven and the new earth. Everybody agrees on this. With differing points of view up to this point, all agree there's a coming final judgment and then the new heaven and the new earth. So today's passage is about that final judgment. And this passage is it's the gateway into the next two chapters of the book of Revelation 21 and 22. And what we see is that there will be a great division of people during this judgment. And it's one thing that's clear in these last three chapters of the Bible. Heaven is not the default place for all people. All people will be judged, but not everyone is going to heaven. That's what the Bible teaches. I say this with great sadness. I, I'd prefer not to preach on this passage today. I'd prefer just to continue on. But this is God's word, and we need to hear it. And I hope that you, you who are listening to me today, you who will be listening online, I hope that your destination is heaven. And if not, I hope and pray that you'll change your destination after your death, after the judgment, so that heaven is your destination. You can do that today. You can do that this hour. You can change your destination for eternity. Choose Jesus. Choose heaven. Randy Alcorn is a Christian writer and speaker. And Randy Alcorn has studied heaven for decades now and written a number of books one book that he's written is called deadline it's a novel and in this novel there are three really close friends they grew up together they went to vietnam together they are back in the same location again together and they watch football games together and this one day they're watching a football game and it comes up to the the um, middle part where you get 20 minutes to run out and get pizza and so what they do, this is part of their game, is they flip a coin and, and they make guesses on what it will be until the one who is the last to be eliminated is the one who has to go get pizza. So this time they flip a coin and it falls on the coffee table, but right on the edge. Doesn't fall this way or that way, just on the edge. So they look at each other perplexed and then they decide, well, I guess we're all going. So they cram into the car and they drive out to the pizza place to get the pizza. God is a controversial subject among these three men. Because one of them, Finney, is a Christian. Another, Doc, is definitely not a Christian. God is no part of his life. And while Finney wants to walk the moral life of someone who's a follower of Jesus, Doc wants nothing to do with it. And Jake, the third guy, is usually in between their arguments. He kind of stands on the fence. And so they, they arrive at the pizza place, and as usual, Doc starts to hit on the cashier, and Finney comes up and reminds him he's a married man with kids about the age of that young girl that's serving him, where Doc gets mad this happens over and over in their relationship. Well, they get the pizza, cram back in the car, Doc's at the wheel, and they take off in the pouring rain to rush back to get back to the game as soon as possible. Very quickly, the car careens out of control and hits a telephone pole, and they're all in a coma. The story continues. Doc is, um, he suffers a spinal injury, and comes to the point very quickly where he says, better dead than alive. And Finney, in the end, doesn't come out of his coma. He dies. And Jake is left wondering, what happened to Finney? Did he really go to heaven to be with Jesus like he believed? Like, is there anything in that? Or is, is Doc correct? It's like, you live you die, there's no God, and that's it, you're done. And so the book continues on. You see, Jake is a, he's an investigative journalist, and the book continues on as he searches for answers that he desperately needs. But I want to ask you this morning, what do you think? When you die, oh, I know, you don't want to think about it. 
And most of you are pretty young. When you die, what's going to happen? I'm sure you thought about it. Everybody does. When you die, what will happen? What do you think? Where will you go when you die? Well, let's go back to our reading and uh, start at verse 11. So on these, first, on these first 10 verses, there are different points of view. If you don't agree with me, it's okay. I love you in the Lord. That's all right. There are different points of view. But let's continue on with verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the word of God. Amen. When I read this passage, these few verses, I see a universality that keeps coming out. And so I want to focus on that universality. And I say, first of all, that all are judged. All are judged. It's the reality of judgment. The scriptures say it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. That's from Hebrews. And that's the idea in this passage today. The entire chapter is about judgment. But here, judgment gets really personal in these last few verses. This is the seventh and final throne scene in the book of Revelation. Verse 11 says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Well, the great white throne represents purity, wisdom, justice, and authority. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. Well, the earth and sky hide from his presence, meaning like everybody tries to hide. They hide from his, his majesty because they're unfit to be in the presence of such holiness. But there's no place to go where he is not present. This scene comes after all the events. All the events in the book of Revelation. All, all the events in all of the Bible come to this scene, the judgment scene. And all through the Old Testament, this judgment scene is being pointed forward. The day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. It's the day of judgment. And the New Testament becomes the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a day of judgment. All is pointing forward to this day. This is the end of human history and the beginning of what we call the eternal state because it doesn't change after this judgment. What happens here determines where you will spend eternity. There are no second chances at this point. You've already made your decision. You will be judged on the basis of your decision. Well, who's the judge? Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Him, that's all we get. Him. And yet we know from other passages that Jesus will be the one who judges. It will be the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 4.1, Paul speaks of Jesus saying that he, it is he who is to judge the living and the dead. In Acts 10, 42, Peter says that Jesus Christ is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. In John 5, 26 to 27, we see that the Father has given to the Son, that is Jesus, this privilege. And we read, this is Jesus speaking, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Jesus, who came to be the Savior of the world, returns as the conquering Lord of lords and King of kings and the judge. 
throughout the book of Revelation, we need to know this. Throughout the book of Revelation, we see that judgment is a good thing, something that's longed for by the people for whom the book was first written. People persecuted, followers of Jesus persecuted because of their faith in Jesus Christ. They long for that day of judgment. And in fact, the great worship passages in Revelation include worship of the judge. And from the passages that I just read, the other passages, we see that it is God, the Son, the Lamb upon the throne, the place of authority. He's the one who will judge. And everyone will be judged. Look at verse 12. And I saw the dead, great and small. That's everyone without exception. Great in society, small in society. Everyone. Standing before the throne. And books were open. The idea is that books, plural. Lots of books. Maybe the idea is a book on every person. Every one of you. There's a biography of you in heaven. Everything you've done. All of who you are. Books are opened. Nothing is hidden from the judge. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and that is the key image for this passage, and we'll come back to that. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they'd done. So again, everyone will be judged. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Judgment becomes very personal. This means everyone, even the sea, which especially at that time was something to be feared. Even the sea will give up its dead. No matter how far a body has disintegrated, it will all nevertheless be resurrected for judgment. No matter how far a body has disintegrated, God knows where the DNA is. He brings it together in resurrection for this judgment time even the sea and the believer and the unbeliever will be judged paul says in romans 2 verses 5 to 7 but because of your hard and impenitent heart you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when god's righteous judgment will be revealed he will render to each one according to his works to those who by patience in well-doing seek glory and honor and immortality he will give eternal life. Luke 12, 2 to 3, Jesus says, Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in private rooms will be proclaimed on the rooftops. And the idea is that judgment is coming for every one of us. Even the believer is judged. In talking to believers, Paul says, Romans 14, verses 10 and 12, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. And then in one of the great resurrection passages, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul talks about the resurrection body, verses 1 to 9. And then, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, this is what he says. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one will receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. But there is a great difference, a great divide, if you wish, Revelation 20, verse 12 says, Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. Believers will stand before the judgment throne knowing this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1. Never forget this. Even though all will be judged when you're in Jesus Christ, when you give your life to Jesus, believing in him, receive Jesus into your life and receive his forgiveness into your life, you are now in a position where you come to that final judgment and you know there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because you were bought with a price and Jesus paid it all. That's why. That's why no condemnation 
You become children of God and your salvation is certain. When you're in Christ, you will be judged, but you will never be judged about your salvation. That is firm in Jesus and what he has done. In the words of Michael Card's song, we look into the face of our judge and we see the face of our Savior. At this judgment of believers, there will be a judgment to evaluate, to give degrees of reward based on our works or our deeds. And there are many places in the New Testament where this is made clear. Paul certainly repeats this a few times. The fact we will face a judgment should never cause believers in Jesus to fear that we will be eternally condemned. We will not. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Jesus, we do not need to fear this last great judgment. And for those who would have read this book at the first, it wouldn't have been fear of that great judgment. It would be wanting to embrace it. How long, O oh Lord? How long? In fact, there's a great difference in judgment. Believers will be rewarded for faithfulness and unbelievers punished for rebellion, for refusing to let Jesus be their leader, to let Jesus be their Lord, to let Jesus be their Savior. As believers, when our sins are exposed on that day, they will be exposed as forgiven. It's like the book is opened. The book of Brian Talbot is opened. And there's everything there. But there's red all over it. Not like your teacher when you were in grade three. It's the blood of Jesus. <laughs> so all those things, all those things that you did, like they're covered by the blood of Jesus. They're stroked out in the blood of Jesus. All of those things. On the one hand, this is a motivation to live a life worthy of the calling that Christ has in us. In the words of Daryl Johnson, who uh, wrote a book on Revelation, he said this, Deeds reveal values. Deeds reveal character. Deeds reveal our true allegiance. And deeds reveal what we really believe. On the final accounting, it will be according to our deeds because deeds are the most reliable indicators of where our faith lies. If Jesus truly intersects your life, your life changes. He brings change into your life. Now, on the other hand, it will be occasion for rejoicing and giving glory to God for the riches of his grace. And Jesus will not give us condemnation but encouragement. It strikes me this way. When the Lord reviews your life with you and notes you giving a bottle of water to a man standing in the corner, the Lord will say, I like that. And you see the smile of pleasure on his face. When the Lord notes the compassion you show to a waitress run off her feet after a night of broken sleep because her child is not well, and you give her a smile of understanding, I mean, maybe even you give her a good tip. And I imagine the Lord saying, I like that, and smiling his pleasure. When you go out of your way to help the marginalized of our society, the people who live on the street, the elderly who have very little to live on, and the people who live with various disabilities, when you give an extra measure of consideration to those suffering from mental illness, I imagine the Lord saying on that judgment day, I like that. And you see the smile of his pleasure. When you go to work tomorrow morning and you do your best for your job because you're doing it as if you're doing it for the Lord and the Lord reviews that, I imagine the Lord saying, I like that. Good on you. And you see the smile of his pleasure. For all these and Many more acts done in the name of Jesus does because Jesus is your Lord and Savior and you share his love and word and deed. And for all these, you look into the face of your judge and you see the face of your Savior. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. All are judged. That's the reality of judgment. 
The second, all will rise. It's the reality of two destinations. And this is clear in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. For instance, look at Daniel 12, verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Two destinations. Jesus clearly taught the same belief when he said this in the Sermon on the Mount. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Matthew 7. And even in the chapters to come, Revelation 21 and, and 22, we see that the result is two destinations. So in Revelation 21, and we'll come to that next week, at the very beginning, we have verses 1 to 7 talking about the new heaven. And then we get verse 8 that says this, Revelation 21, 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. This is the second death. So your first death is your natural death. And the second death is that continuing death permanent, ongoing death in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. And in, at the end of chapter 21, after this, this incredible description of Jerusalem that's so beautiful, it can hardly be described. At the end of that, we read, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, meaning the new Jerusalem, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So what are the two destinations? Look back at chapter 20, Revelation 20, verse 15. It says, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now simply put, there are two destinations. One is heaven and the other is hell. One is reached because your name is in the book of life. And the other is reached because your name is not in the book of life. The lake of fire is the second death. It's what, what we call hell. And the final destination of the wicked is there. And even death itself and, and Hades, the place of the dead, will be thrown into the lake of fire. When they will have no more power. So you notice in those first verses I read in Revelation 20 that the false prophet is thrown in there. The beast, the beast is thrown in there. And the dragon, who is Satan, he's thrown into that lake of fire. And then, then death and Hades itself are thrown into the lake of fire. But they no longer have any power over those who are in Jesus and are, who are experiencing this eternal life. It's like that statement, the death of death and the death of Jesus. Death is dead, powerless, thrown into the lake of fire. The Bible refers to eternal suffering in hell in very sobering terms. I want to tell you, I don't want to preach the sermon. I don't want to say these passages, but this is in the word of God. And I told God I would preach his word. Mark 9, 43, Jesus says, hell where the fire never goes out. In Matthew 25, 41, and Jude 7, we read the eternal fire. And in Revelation 14 and 11, we read, the smoke of the torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night. And in Jude 13, the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. So hell is a place of eternal conscious punishment for those who don't belong to Jesus. It's a place of eternal separation from God and therefore separation from all that is good, pleasant, beautiful. All that is God. And there's one thing for sure, hell is no party. There's no party where co-conspirators reminisce about days of bad deeds gone by. No. In fact, the blackest darkness from Jude suggests absolute isolation. Absolute isolation. I think of it like being trapped in a coal mine where, where the coal mine has closed up. There's been a cave-in and you're alone by yourself, no light. 
totally black. Or maybe like an avalanche of snow, and you're caught in that, and it's covered you, and, and it's hopeless. You're totally alone. Or maybe like a landslide avalanche, and you're caught in that landslide avalanche, and it, it covers you with no escape. You see, the thing is, what you get is, what you want is what you get. I mean, what do you really want for eternity? What you want is what you get, what you really want. If you don't want Jesus in this life, then you don't get Jesus. And heaven is all about Jesus. If you don't want Jesus, don't want to submit to him, if you don't want to come to Jesus for forgiveness of sins, if you don't want an intimate relationship with Jesus, then you get what you want. And that alternative is hell. The thought of eternal punishment is, it's always a problem for us as followers of Jesus. We enjoy the grace of God and the salvation of Christ. And when we truly see the love and the mercy of God and and along with his holiness and, and sternness, we long for everybody to participate in that. But the Bible is clear. It's clear about the punishment of the wicked, those who do not submit to Jesus, and it's eternal. And I, I think it's right that we should be disturbed by this biblical doctrine, this biblical truth. There was a famous preacher, Scottish preacher, in the 1700s, and one of the, one of the young guys he was mentoring, they met together, and the young guy was going on about how he preached on sin and hell and he just really gave it to them and this older preacher said oh, but did you preach it with tears in your eyes did you preach it with tears in your eyes the thought of eternal punishment is a problem absolutely I think it's right that we should be disturbed by this biblical truth even God in Ezekiel 33, 11 says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. The wicked are those who reject God and his way. But the same biblical doctrine can motivate us. It can motivate us to pray for those who do not know Christ personally, who are not committed to following him. And we can look for ways to share with them God's gracious love, who longs to forgive and shape the lives of those who know him. So the doctrine of hell is a problem. Maybe you'd like to do away with it altogether. Everybody goes to heaven. Well, just think about that for a minute. Everybody goes to heaven. Hitler goes to heaven. Mm -hmm. Stalin goes to heaven. Yeah, well, the serial killer goes to heaven. Ew, okay. Sex offender who has an average of 80 to 100 victims. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, he goes to heaven. Really? But as soon as you start to think like that, you're saying there is a divide. There is a divide. And when we get to that point, we have to say, God's the one who decides on that divide, not us. God is the one to decide. All are judged. It's the reality of judgment. All will rise. It's the reality of two destinations. All the difference, the book of life. So what is the book of life, and how do we get into this book of life? How do we get our names in this book of life? Well, in the Old Testament, the book of life is God's book. It's the register of those who held citizenship in the theocratic, that is the God-directed community of Israel. And in, it's really interesting. In Exodus 32, after Moses has led Israel out of Egypt, they're in the desert. Moses goes up on the mountain to get uh, the, the directions, the instructions from God. And he comes back down. And they're worshiping a golden calf. And they're saying, here is the God that brought us out of Egypt. And, and Moses takes these Ten Commandments and he breaks them. Well, they're already broken. As soon as he arrives down there, they're already broken with the calf. And, and then God says that he's going to punish the people. He's going to get rid of them and start again with Moses. 
And Moses pleads with God for the people of Israel and offers to have his own name removed from the book God has written to save the people, referring to this book of life. And in the New Testament, it's all those who hold citizenship in the kingdom of God and they're citizens of heaven through Jesus Christ. We have our names written in the book of life. Well, to be blotted out would mean to lose membership. And God says to Moses, this isn't going to happen. And in the letter to Sardis in Revelation 3, Jesus says, this is not going to happen. Names are not going to be blotted out. In Revelation 20, 15, it's clear that having your name in the book of life is the key to getting into heaven and not going to hell. And the book of life is a record of those participating in eternal life and and that eternal life will continue in a magnified way after the death of this body with Jesus in heaven. It starts here and now. John 17, 3 says, Jesus says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You know Jesus here and now in this life. And eternal life has started for you. All are judged. It's the reality of judgment. All will rise, the reality of two destinations, all the difference, the book of life. And finally, all for free. I'm going to skip to the end of the book of Revelation. We'll come back to this later in more detail. Revelation 22, 17 says, The spirit and the bride say, come. And the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life, that's eternal life, without price. Why without price? Because the price has already been paid by Jesus and his death on the cross. All for free, all yours, when your name is written in the book of life. In fact, that's how your name is written in the book of life. So how do we get our names into the book of life? I mean, how do we participate in this new life that Jesus promises, this eternal life? Well, to answer that question really is to tell you the good news, the gospel. But I want to ask you this question. If you were to die tonight and you find yourself standing before God and God were to ask you, why should I let you enjoy eternal life with me? I mean, what would you say? If you were to die tonight and find yourself standing before God and God were to ask you, why should I let you enjoy eternal life with me? I mean, what would you say? Well, perhaps the best way to answer this question is just to tell you briefly how my name came to be in the book of life. I was only seven years old. That means you don't need a theology degree to understand this. Seven years old, I went to a kid's club. We are memorizing these different verses, and I memorized John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And as I memorized that verse, it just got really personal. I realized God loved me, seven-year-old Brian, and that Jesus had died for me. And that I could have that everlasting life in Jesus. It was God working in my life. And so I prayed and I asked Jesus to come into my life, to forgive my sin. Even at seven, I knew I'd done wrong things. To forgive me of my sins, the wrong things that I'd done, come into my life and to give me his new life. And that is when God wrote my name in his book of life, eternal life. Let's pray together. Jesus, we worship you as the one the one true God, the one true Savior and Lord. We worship you as the judge as well. And it grieves our heart that we have friends, we have relatives who do not know you personally, Jesus. And we don't want us to even say it out loud, but we know that their destination is not heaven. Oh, Jesus. Break our heart as yours is broken for these people who have not yet turned to you and give us opportunities to share you and your salvation with them in word and in deed. And they come to know you. 
as their personal Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. If you're able to, would you stand with us and let's respond in song together. Sing a thousand generations. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry, oh. All creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. And if you've been forgiven, or if you've been redeemed, We'll sing the song forever to the Lamb. Oh, if you walk in freedom, if you bear his name, we'll sing the song forever to the Lamb. We'll sing the song forever and amen. Angels cry. creation cries holy you are lifted high holy holy forever hear people sing holy to the king of kings the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all your name your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cry
you will always be holy, holy forever. Let's sing that again. You will always. You will always be holy, holy forever. Amen. Uh, you can take a seat, and we have uh, two or three announcements. Um, Andrew is going to come. You can do your announcement first. Can we have the, the mic, please? Okay, so I have an announcement. Um, so this is related to a pastoral search, and I'm gonna read, it's a little bit lengthy, but I wanna get it all, because it's really important. So after prayerful consideration um, of um, the last candidate we had, that was Dar Darren Mealy, the elders have come to a decision not to invite him to serve as the full-time lead pastor at West Village Church. Um, now we thoroughly, thoroughly reviewed his candidacy, um, in the process, we developed a tremendous appreci appreciation for him um, and his family and his ministry. He was very, very open to us and expressed a love for God and his church and the work that's involved in building the church. Um, that said, we didn't have the conviction that he was the right person for Words with Age at this time. And this is a difficult decision to come to because we know that he... Um, that candidate, Darren, was capable and qualified to lead a church, uh, just not West Village Church. So we want to say, um, one, just express our gratitude to Darren um, for the courage and vulnerability involved in applying for the role and engaging with us in the process. Uh, and we are trusting God to strengthen him and to lead him as he continues to serve um, his, his Lord and Savior faithfully. Uh, we also want to express um, a lot of gratitude to the pastoral church team for their dedication and prayer throughout the whole process. It's been about a year, and they've, they've put a lot of time and effort and lots of prayer into the process. Um, and so they're in the process of reevaluating and recommitting themselves. Um, some of them may decide to step away from the process right now. Um, they've given it a lot of time and energy, and it's only fair to give them the opportunity to step away if necessary. So um, because of that, we want to say um, a big thank you to all of them uh, for giving of themselves for Christ and his church here at West Village. Um, we would also want to say a big thank you to Brian and Susan for their faithful service at West Village Church. Um, that was the first call we made after we made a decision concerning Darren, just checking with Brian and see how he's doing and if he's eager to leave. <laughs> he's not. Um, so Brian has confirmed his willingness to stay with us and give us time to be able to find the right person for our church. In fact, I'll also say that in the last few weeks, we've learned a lot, um, a lot from, particularly from the candidate, candidates, um, Darren and, and Dan, uh, they were both very, very gracious and generous to us, um, from the staff, from the AGC, and from the ministry leaders, and. We ha we're going to take all of those lessons and, and review the process that we have and make some changes, and then we're going to recommit ourselves and start continue the search. So we're going to ask for prayer, and um, you're going to have this in writing, but I'll just mention it today. So pr please be praying for the candidates and their families and their ministries. Um, for both Dan and Darren and, and their families, it's a time of transition for them, and they are still seeking the law concerning jobs or other things concerning their ministry. So please continue in prayer for them. And continue in prayer for Brian and Susan, for the pastoral church team. Um, please be in prayer for our church, for there to be unity amongst our church. Um, we've, we've been blessed to be united in, in this season, for that to continue. And for wisdom from God, uh, who is very generous with wisdom, and to lead us to find the right pastor for us. Okay. And then finally, we'll say, although we would have hoped to have found a lead pastor by now, um, we believe God is leading us to the right candidate he has for West Village Church. We are learning to be patient. Um, I'd have loved to have finished the patient lesson like six months ago. 
we are still learning, and to depend on God and to find our hope in him. So we're going to trust him to continue to guide us um, as we seek his face for the next steps. Okay? Um, because we have a connect lunch today, all the elders are going to be around. If you have any specific questions concerning the process or you want to give us an input or feedback, please don't hesitate to come have a conversation with any of us. So myself, Gary, Tulu, and Chris are all going to be available to answer any questions that you have. All right. Thank you so much. A couple of other um, announcements. Uh, the first one is that next week we'll start another membership course. And uh, you can go to the Connect table to sign up for that. Uh, Tolu is standing right over there in the corner. He's the one who will be leading the course. You can ask him if you have uh, other questions. Also, there is a Karis Disability Services training event coming up on uh, Friday, November 1st at our office. And Jasmine Duckworth from Karis Disability Services, which was uh, Christian Horizons, will lead a training event for us about how we at West Village can be more inclusive for those with disabilities. It's meant for anyone interested, no matter where you're serving, it will be valuable for you to attend. There will also be the option to attend virtually as well. So, um, and now we come to the Connect Lunch. Um, Everybody, I uh, hope everybody will go to the Connect lunch. There's lots of food, and we'd like to connect with one another. There are some um, uh, name stickers there and some directions at the table that we'll put your name on. Um, so we'll enjoy that together. I, I just want to say that I'll be at the front for a few minutes. I said a lot this morning, and might be disturbing, I'd be happy to talk to you about anything that I've said. And if you are here and you're a person and you think, I'm not sure my name is written in the book of life, I'd like to talk to you about that and share with you more about that. Go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the love of the Father, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.